Coming up on Tech News Today, bringing the internet to low-income Americans. The FBI seeks even more access to NSA's vault of data. Is AI about to take your job? Uh, Oversharing in the digital photo age and so much more. Tech News Today is next. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. Hi, everybody. It's time for our annual audience survey. We'd really like to hear from you. It helps us understand our audience better, know what you like and don't like, how you listen to the show. It also helps us tell advertisers what kind of people listen. But I promise you, your feedback is always kept personally anonymous. All you have to do is visit twit.tv slash survey and let us know what you think. It'll just take a few minutes and it'll help us make Twit even better. We really appreciate your support and any help you can give us, twit.tv slash survey. This is Tech News Today, episode 1465, recorded Tuesday, March 8th, 2016. This episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by ZipRecruiter. Are you hiring? With ZipRecruiter.com, you can post to 100-plus job sites, including social networks, all with a single click. Screen, rate, and hire the right candidates fast. Try ZipRecruiter with a free four-day trial now at ZipRecruiter.com slash TNT. And by the Ring Video Doorbell. With Ring, you can see and talk to anyone at your door from anywhere in the world using your smartphone. It's like caller ID for your home. Right now, get free expedited FedEx shipping when you go to ring.com slash TNT. And by FreshBooks, the super simple cloud accounting software that's giving thousands of freelancers and small businesses the tools to save time billing and get paid faster. Try it free at freshbooks.com slash TNT. Hello and welcome to Tech News Today. This is the show where we talk about the tech news with people who see both sides of the argument mm -hmm. in technology. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they play devil's advocate, Sometimes, maybe. sometimes they do. Mm -hmm. I am Megan Maroney. And I am Jason Howell. Joining us is maybe one of those devils that will play the advocate today, Becky Worley. How's it going, Becky? That's right. I hate the technology. <laughs> I don't want to love it. I don't like it. I like the old days. <laughs> yes, take me back to pad and pencil. That was an excellent, that reminded me of uh, On Golden Pond a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> on Golden Pond, for those of you who don't know. Uh, right. Yeah, wow, that was a really long time ago. I, I barely remember that movie. The loons, Norman. <laughs> <laughs> Well, speaking of great women, uh, let's talk about International <laughs> Women's Day. Uh, that's today. Uh, two women in tech headlines caught our eyes today. Let's do the good news first. Motherboard put together an A to Z of women pushing boundaries in science and technology. The list includes Kate Darling, a research specialist at MIT's Media Lab, who is a leading expert in robot ethics. Thank you, Kate. Whitney Phillips, who spent four years undercover as a 4chan troll and who researches the cultural impact of memes. And Nijeri Rion, serial entrepreneur in Kenya who founded the most successful cable, broadband, and internet-based phone companies in East Africa. And Manoush Zomorodi, host of the tech podcast Note to Self, who we will be interviewing on this show next week. Lots of women in technology. Turns out I'm surrounded by a couple right now, in fact. <laughs> you are. Uh, so, I don't know. All, all I can say is that, you know, I've, I've worked in the tech industry for 10 years. And I think a big part of this, at least as it relates to this show, is the tech industry. It seems like this constant story that keeps coming out, both, you know, from a minority aspect and also from women in tech and, and that sort of stuff. And, I, man, I feel like if, I don't know, I've just, I've been surrounded by awesome, smart women in my career and I've learned so much from them. So it's, 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 I guess, a different perspective than I suppose a lot of other people have, apparently, because that is absolutely not the way that it is, um, you know, elsewhere. And I don't know how I got so lucky. So there you go. Well, you're surrounded by women. Your wife's an uber feminist. You have two daughters. You are a feminist. So it's I, not, <laughs> you work in a place that actually has women yeah. there. Um, that, that is true. Those things help. That um, is absolutely true. I have a friend who, um, 
she models for a living, mathematical models, that is. <laughs> and she is always in these sausage fest startup companies. And it's it's really a challenge, she says, because they're young guys who have been around other young guys. And um, there's just, it, it's it's not just the big tech companies where they're working really hard on diversity and changing culture, but also in the smaller companies where they're just bootstrapping and scrambling. And in those environments, it's young people. There's not a lot of infrastructure in the companies. And I think there there isn't as much um, foundation and infrastructure for diversity and and having a, an openness to women there. I mean, just little stuff like having to breastfeed in the bathroom, people being uncomfortable when you say you're pregnant, you know, stuff like that that she's told me that is uh, not perfect. That being said, I just went through and made my own little honor roll in the in the big tech companies. Mary Meeker, huge VC here at Kleiner Perkins, Cheryl Sandberg, Marissa Meyer, Meg Whitman, Xerox's CEO, Ursula Burns, Ginny Rometty, IBM's CEO, uh, the CTO at Cisco, Pad Masri Warrior, I hope I said that right, um, the Wojcicki sisters, YouTube CEO, 23andMe co-founder, one we don't talk about a lot, Cher Wang, she's the co-founder of HTC and now she's their CEO. So mm -hmm. um, some inroads, some problems. Right. I mean, that was the other headline from CNET said that there was a so-so year for technology, but I didn't really, I, I don't really agree with that. I mean, they used it as an exa example that uh, one login engineer ads that we remember from last year, uh, there was an attractive woman in one of the ads and a bunch of people said, well, that woman's not a really an engineer. They must have hired a model to do that. And in fact, they did not. She was actually an engineer, is an engineer, but that started the, I look like an engineer movement, which I think brought to light this problem and was a positive in the end. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And a big part, you know, uh, of all of this is kind of goes back to STEM education and, you know, looking kind of at, at the younger, you know, the younger years in, in elementary school and junior high and all that kind of stuff, how much engagement, uh, let's say women, for example, have with science technology, you know, just the STEM kind of uh, framework. Has that changed? Are we at a point where that has actually changed and, and hopefully for the better? What do you guys think? I hope so. I mean, I think I, I don't think that my daughter and son or get treated really differently in school when they're learning these these things. I mean, my daughter takes a robotics class. You know, she uh, I don't think she gets treated differently. So I'm mm -hmm. hoping. But that's just my own experience with my own children. Well, and then and then you kind of go backwards. Like, I, you know, when I was a kid. It was very, you know, common to hear that something was, uh, oh, well, that's that's a boy's thing, you know, or that's a girl's thing, you know, when, when related to, let's say, mathematics is just one example. And I really hope that we're at a point to where that isn't isn't happening as much, if at all. I know I know, I, you know, I can only speak for myself and we certainly don't don't prescribe to that. So we try and you know make sure that our daughters realize that they truly can be interested and, you know, uh, find find something that, you know, maybe 20, 30, 40 years would have been pegged as a boy's thing, mm -hmm. uh, that, that they can explore that as long as they're happy. I think my, my thoughts on this always kind of come around just in a general sense. Now, I hope that we get to a point in this world where it's not, where we don't feel that we need to talk about women in technology or you know minorities in technology or, or just in general because it's just so normal that it's not weird and you know or outside of of the norm and that's where i feel like we're constantly at right now and not that it's a bad thing to talk about it i think that's that's kind of how you how you raise awareness around that but man i hope that someday we get to a point to where where it's just kind of normal. And so talking about it doesn't even occur to you because it's just the way it is and the way that we don't really talk about men in technology because there's a lot of dudes in tech. Like, that, <laughs> and it's been that way for years. So it's, you know, not so outside of the norm that we feel like we need to talk about it. I don't know. That, that, that's my Well, I do box. see some change. I mean, walking around Yahoo, it's like a skit out of Silicon Valley, the show on HBO. There's, there is that pack, you know? There's like two white guys, two mm -hmm. Southeast Asian guys, and a woman. Like, it's just bizarre that that is always like a pack of five that's walking around. And right. you're sort of thinking, maybe we are such a cultural um, melting pot here in Silicon Valley where it really doesn't feel like um, the, the cultural issues are, are happening as much um, in the tech industry. It's still, I mean, don't get me wrong, um, 
we're not seeing enough African Americans in these industries. And we do still see women falling away from science and math in those mm -hmm. middle school years. But I think it's a slow progression. And to your point, Jason, it's not women in tech, it's people in tech. Exactly. Yep. All right. Well, there we go. Uh, that's a heavy one to start off with. Uh, Bill Gates, so we're going to lighten it a little bit here, obviously, with Bill Gates taking to Reddit, of all places, for an AMA. This isn't his first time. He's done this a few times before. You had to guess that some fun little nuggets were going to be found littering the ground afterwards, and here we are with those nuggets. Uh, so basically, he uh, talked a little bit. Well, first of all, actually, before we get into what he talked about, his verification, because you got to do this when you're doing an AMA, you have to like verify with a photo that you are who you are, especially when you're as famous as someone like Bill Gates. He verified himself by rec recreating an old photograph of him from 1973 when he was a teenager. I don't know if you have have that picture. Um, so this is this is the one now. If you scroll down a little bit, The Verge has this thing that you can kind of pull the slide. No, that's the image that you yeah, just right, passed. Yeah. Uh, and you can pull the slider and see the differences between the before and after. <laughs> and I was flipping back and forth on this for like five minutes, like picking out all the things. Their attention to detail on this was pretty impressive. I guess he's got more money than God, but. Right. He's laying on a desk. He's got a rotary phone to on the, the table next to him with some sort of a, what do you think that is, a terminal? I don't know. Someone will be able to very quickly <laughs> tell us what Back computer machine? that is. <laughs> <laughs> something is up on the desk he looks way cooler than you would think bill gates is capable of being oh he yeah. kind of looks like a like a skater he but does you could, look like a skater you could yeah. imagine him wearing those shoes like, today yeah oh. well i mean don't don't imagine it there they are <laughs> he's wearing them it's pretty awesome uh, that is the i would say having read most of the reddit that was the the best thing about it uh yeah definitely got a lot of uptake and and the reason for this of course you can see on the wall is his reddit username so that's a pretty epic way of, of verifying yourself mm -hmm. um i think the main thing that people were looking for because he's been in the news the past couple of weeks about uh comments that he made which didn't really seem to take a side as far as the apple fbi um iphone case is concerned he clarified his stance basically in the ama he didn't really go much beyond that. It seemed, you know, it seemed like basically all he was saying was, yep, there's going to have to be discussions about this stuff. <laughs> and that's all there is to it. Basically, I think there needs to be a discussion about these things and that laws need to be modernized. So he's just he's not willing to kind of jump in there and give give much of his opinion on this topic. Well, he is an amazing man. I mean, no one doubts what the company that he created is amazing. The, I mean, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation gives so much money to, to some really uh, amazing I mean, to places that need it. I mean, he, mm -hmm. you know, they, they donate so much to AIDS research there. They care so much about the environment, but he's kind of boring. <laughs> Bill Gates is boring. He's a little bit, you know, he's one of those, he doesn't say the crazy stuff yeah. like, you know, Steve Jobs did or, you know, like any of the, you know, like Mark Zuckerberg. He's, he's just a little bit eh. even keel, mm -hmm. level headed. Uh, yeah. What do you think? Uh, were you bored, Becky? Uh, I thought there were some cool tidbits. I mean, the, the whole bit about he would stop and pick up forty thousand dollars on the yeah. uh, on the sidewalk if he was walking down the street. This is from an earlier TED talk about how forty thousand bucks to Bill Gates is like a quarter to the rest of us. Um, but the guy is really very. His philanthropy has driven him for so much of the latter part of his life. I think he's gun shy, having been sort of yeah. misquoted about the FBI Apple thing. So it's understandable that he would come in with sort of a milk toast answer on that. <laughs> that doesn't surprise me. Um, I, I, I'm constantly amazed by Bill and Melinda Gates. She is as compelling of a character as he is when it comes to their philanthropy. It's really incredible. Um, their friendship with, you know, Bono and Warren Buffett and all the things that that um, group of movers and shakers have done in the world is pretty impressive. So, yeah, he's super boring. <laughs> he did. Well, I, I mean, I understand what you're saying. You're not saying what he does is boring necessarily. Well, you're just saying I mean, kind of like as a person. Some parts of Microsoft that are boring. Well, <laughs> okay. I, I suppose I can kind of see that. But he's doing some pretty impressive yes. things. I think we can all agree uh, a lot of the things that, that they're doing with a foundation. Like, 
we're not slamming the the efforts of the foundation uh, by saying that. Um, I, I feel like maybe it's a little more of like a personality trait is that he's just not an exciting guy necessarily. Right. You no, know? he's <laughs> an old guy. <laughs> he is boring. Like the stuff they yeah. do is incredible. But yeah. there are old people who've been who are really media savvy. Yeah. And they don't have an ax to grind or a business to build on one comment. They're just, right. you know, mature. Yeah. Right. Well, there were some there were some mature, interesting things even. that he did say uh, about technology and education, which I found fascinating. He said technology is starting to improve education. Unfortunately, so far, it's mostly the motivated students who have benefited from it, which I thought that was really interesting. It's not you know, it's not that it's just a tool. It's not going to change students' lives or anyone's lives. You have to be motivated in order to use it. And he also said this about teachers. There are a lot of great teachers, but we don't do enough to figure out what they do so well and make sure others benefit from that. Most teachers mm -hmm. get very little feedback about what they do well and what they need to improve, including tools that let them see what the exemplars are doing. So I thought that was fascinating. I mean, not really, that second part isn't really related to technology at all, but uh, in terms of teaching i think that's really interesting there, there are a lot of great teachers but we don't really know how to to make more teachers better right yeah. right uh he also talked a little bit about artificial intelligence said it needs to be regulated sooner rather than later uh so we can avoid you know a couple of people with a lot of control and power over it once it becomes uh mature which uh, yeah i would agree agree with that i think we're starting to see that a little bit i mean we're st certainly starting to see people concerned with it, so right. where that leads to change. Well, yeah, so here's to Bill Gates, who doesn't tweet crazy stuff like Elon Musk or he doesn't Shut have a huge air. But he <laughs> exactly. creates an awesome verification photo. We'll give you that. Yes. Good work. Well, moving on, in a blog post today, FCC Chairman Tom Wheeler announced that they are modernizing the government's lifeline program that provides phone service to the poor. Later this month, the Federal Communications Commission will vote on changing lifeline subsidy to offer low-income Americans $9.25 a month to purchase either home internet service or cellular data. Now, Becky, you looked into this a little bit. Lifeline has been sort of, you know, it's it's been caused accused of having like a lot of fraud people have been using it it's kind of messed up like many government programs are um what do you think about this uh, i think it, it's it's worth weighing up the pros and cons so the pros are that many of the people who use the lifeline subsidy so this is money that you get to subsidize your telephone bill can now be used for mobile or internet um it one of the big objectives here on the pro side was narrowing the, what they call the homework gap, the idea that um, low-income families who are struggling to be able to afford broadband in the home, uh, their kids don't have as much uh, access to the internet as they're doing their homework. And it's something like 30% of low-income homes don't have access to the internet when it's the numbers are more like 15% of the general population either choose not to have the internet at home or can't afford it. So you can see the positives there. And this is something really talking about helping um, get that homework gap smaller, but there are also some issues here. So it's going to increase the the budget for this program by about $2.5 billion. It's give or take. I can't remember the number exactly. That's a 50% increase, according to the Washington Post, on what the budget is right now. So I thought, okay, where does this money come from? And I went and looked, and um, it comes from the FCC, they have a budget for it, and it's assessed on interstate uh, transmission of data, basically um, big uh, mobile, landline, long distance, and internet companies. And then I saw that Michael O'Reilly, who is the one of the five commissioners uh, on this panel uh, for the FCC, that he had really written a pretty scathing um, uh, I would say dissent on on this proposal saying that we can't afford it. And sure enough, I went and looked at my bill. I pay a dollar and sixty two cents every month to support this on my mobile phone bill, and so do you. Something I'm not sure if it's I think it's percentage wise. So if that's that's coming from you and me. That's not being just assessed to the carriers. We're paying that out of our pocket. And they're, when you look at that big chunk of fees that comes in on your bill every month, it's listed out by name. 
Well, it's good. I mean, I don't usually read the list of feeds, but I don't mind paying that. <laughs> you know, as the other ones that I don't understand. But I get where you're coming from. Yeah, the money well, has think, to come somewhere. Think about it this way. If it's a buck 62 for me, and it's, I'm not sure what the increase is, but they change the rate every quarter based on what the needs are for the program. So let's say hypothetically, and I don't know if this is true, but hypothetically, let's say that that goes up by 50% as the budget is going up, right? So now I'm paying $2.40 a month to subsidize $9.60 for a subset of the population. Now, if every person is paying that, what? That, that, that's a lot of money going to subsidize in a smaller amount. Do you know what I'm saying? Like that's, that's two bucks and 40 cents off mine to pay $9 on theirs. Mm -hmm. And, and $9, uh, I mean, everybody, you know, probably listening to this, probably very few of us pay $9 for internet access or cell phone, you know, access a month. I mean, so, so those no, are- That's our, just a subsidy they're getting. Right. It's mm -hmm. just a subsidy, but then the, the pro, some of the programs, some of the very basic internet programs uh, are, you don't have to pay much more than that. I mean, there's like the basics from Comcast right. or whatever. So like someone else is, you know, Comcast is also subsidizing this somewhat. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, think it, it has to be 10 down and one up is the minimum for the companies they can use this subsidy on megabytes down and 10 megabytes right. down, one right. megabyte up. Don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm, I'm up for making sure that we make broadband available to everyone. I just really wanted to look at it from a dollars and cents standpoint and figure out why there was opposition. Right. I mean, I think that there was opposition also because the, the program, the Lifeline, has been used fraudulently in the past. Um, you're right. It is a lot of money. I mean, that you're, you're totally right. I think that no one's arguing that, uh, that, that, that the homework gap exists. Like, it obviously exists. Like, people, uh, everyone needs the Internet now, not only just to do homework, but to apply for jobs. And, you know, it's not just Internet access, but, like, those websites need to work on mobile phones because that's sometimes the only thing that people have. But, yeah, sometimes these headlines do just make you seem like, yeah, why don't we all, you know, that sounds great. Like, everybody should have Internet access. But, yeah, where does the money come and from? And tax the big companies. They're the ones who are profiting. Well, it's on my bill. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. That's a good point. That's a good mm -hmm. point. Uh, yeah, and like you said, 10 down, one up, 150 gig a month allowance, which I think is reasonable. The FCC defines broadband as 25 down, three up, so it's not quite in the broadband category as far as the FCC is concerned, but I suppose better than nothing. Um, well, they had to yeah. redefine it in order to say, you know, to... Mm -hmm. to like they redefined it today, I think, after they made this blog post, after Tom Wheeler made this blog post, what does broadband really mean? And then what does it also, mean? Think about the rural people, the, yeah. the, the rural low-income folks who may not have access to any broadband that necessarily, well, I mean, I guess if you have satellite, you're not going to get a meg up, do you? I don't know exactly what the stats are, but it used yeah. to be that you used to get decent down, but slow up. And so since a lot of this may affect the rural poor, mm. you kind of wonder if this is even going to make a dent. Right. Yeah. Like if you don't, if you can't get broadband apply. where you are, you can't get it no matter how much you're getting subsidized. Mm -hmm. You just can't get it. Um, well, let's see. I'm trying to transition from homework gap to yik yak. <laughs> I don't know if it's possible. <laughs> the yik yak gap. Is yeah. what they call it. The yik yak the, gap. It's not from the homework gap. It's from... National Women's Day, where part of what we're trying to do as women online is to not be harassed That's true. and have hate speech online. And yik yak, mm, I yeah. don't know about that. Yeah, so mm. yik yak. So uh, we, we actually talked on the show yesterday about what anonymity online will normally lead to when you're talking about social interaction on the Internet. Uh, summary, usually an abundance of mean words. Yik Yak is a location-based social network we've talked about it on the show before. It's received its fair share of criticism, and that's specifically because it's an anonymous network, essentially. Um, starting today, users can choose to create a handle for themselves uh, to be represented to their posts, removing a piece of that anonymity uh, that has kind of defined the service up until this point, which, um, you know, it's, it's interesting that they're doing this now. I mean, they're not making money yet. Uh, there is no revenue generation at this point. So I'm wondering if, you know, a part of this is that user identification makes it possible for you to get money in more more ways, you know, versus a truly anonymous network. Um, but, you know, also kind of accountability is a big part of that. Obviously, 
you, you're maybe less inclined to say bad things about people, which is something that Yikak is kind of known for, <laughs> especially in schools and stuff. Um, if uh, you know, if your real name is attached to that, so yeah. or I mean, if your if your handle is like baseball fan or right. I love chocolate, then you know advertisers can figure <laughs> that out and <laughs> you know know what so, to yeah. advertise to you. I yeah. guess uh, you don't have to use the handle. You, no, you can. it's an optional. At, at, yeah. at least at first, it's optional. Mm -hmm. But you can kind of. I I really like looking at this anonymity issue from a little slightly different perspective, which is uh, the coin of the realm that we love about. I don't know if it's media right now or uh, certain environments online is authenticity. Yeah. Authenticity is why Donald Trump is soaring, why Bernie Sanders is soaring. Um, it's the reality shows that actually you have a moment where something real happens. Um, and anonymity leads to a little bit more authenticity online. So I can see how anonymity really provides a space, especially for college-age kids, uh, to say what they really want to say in that group online space. So then looking at the other side of the coin, anonymity can lead to all of the things you just mentioned, Jason, to hate speech, bullying, misogyny, um, you know, just horrible, you know, revenge porn, things like that. Um, so one theory is that a handle preserves anonymity, but it makes you accountable all across the space. So let's say that you're in a community that's for your university or what have you. You know, if you post a lot about football and then you go out and smear someone's name, well, maybe that travels across the site with you because your handle is attached to it and it preserves authenticity because at least you're not, it's not your real name. I don't know. I'm just looking at it from all sides. I can see where it makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's how Yelp works, right? Like if I go and I see, you know, that, that someone had a really super negative review of the restaurant I want to go to, like I don't know who that person is, but I can click on their handle and see all the other things they review. And if they're a super negative person about everything, uh, then I'm like, eh, well, maybe their review isn't accurate. So I, I get it. I mean, what one thing about this is remember when the whole internet was handles? Like remember when that, mm -hmm. like before Facebook where it was like you used a handle, you were never like, I was never Megan Maroney online. I, you know, I was something else. And, mm -hmm. and it's interesting. That's where it started. And then now it's shifted over like really through Facebook and, you know, Mark Zuckerberg's really like everyone should be who they are, Real you names. know? Yeah. On the internet. And now we're sort of moving. We, we swung all the way to anonymous and I like this. I, I think... I mean, it's not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to say that everyone should go get Yik Yak. I, I'm not in college, so I don't know what, uh, but I can understand that it might be useful. Mm -hmm. And I can also Just understand. Just search Yik Yak and whatever college name you want. And the first 10 things that come are like horrible incidents of, uh, you know, bullying or mm -hmm. legal issues. I mean, it's, uh, yeah. No, yeah. Thanks. I mean, yeah, because I was going to say, I think that that stuff is the one, the stuff that gets headlines because it's fear. Like every time someone says cyberbullying, like everyone, you know, once, like that's always on the news. But, you know, it sure. is a real thing. But at the same time, there, you know, it might, it might not be what's going on in every community and every anonymous room there is to mm -hmm. talk. And this Total might improve it. That my, there was a website that allowed college girls to rank college boys. I mean, if this were the other way around, it would have been absolute outward, but there was an app that did this. And so I was just so curious about it. I, I was pitching the story to GMA. And I thought, gosh, is this, is this real? Does this actually, is this completely fake? So I searched this, my friend's kid who was going to school. Uh, he was like a sophomore someplace. And sure enough, his, his name came up and it said, blah, 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 dumb as a box of hammers, but smells amazeballs. <laughs> So every time I see the kid now, that's all I can think of. And I'm just, that is what anonymous posting does. Yeah. Is like, You've been, oh my God, it, you, you can't unsee those things. You've been reprogrammed at this point, whether you wanted to or not. Yeah, that's unfortunate. <laughs> um, coming up, we're going to take a look at the impending threat. I feel like there's a lot of like threats today uh, of artificial intelligence taking your jobs. But first, let's take a minute to thank the sponsor of this episode, and that is ZipRecruiter. If you're hiring, uh, you don't know where, you know, you can find the best candidates. Uh, you you want to know this, right? You're a business owner. Your company is only as good as the people that you hire, so you know the importance of this. Posting jobs in one place 
isn't always enough to find the right candidates, the people that you actually need. And if you're short staffed, that's not going to leave very much time for you to do the things that you need to do, which is basically post to all of the job sites all over the internet to try and find the right people. It's just too much work for one person. It leaves you short, uh, you know, on the, on the time that you need to do the things that you need to do to run your business. Well, thanks to ZipRecruiter.com, you can now post to 100 plus job sites with one single click makes it all super easy for you you'll be instantly matched to candidates from over nearly six million resumes all you do is you post that one time and then within 24 hours you'll watch as the candidates just kind of roll into the interface the recruiter has an awesome easy to use interface that makes you know kind of sifting through all of these options a breeze zip recruiter has been used by over 400,000 businesses you can try it now for free for yourself to see what it's all about Getting the right people for your company is so important. It's one of the most important things, actually, because they represent you. Dan, a happy ZipRecruiter client, said the hardest part about running a business when you need to hire is that you have to spend extra time recruiting while you're short-staffed. But with ZipRecruiter, I've gotten quality candidates within 24 hours of posting a job. ZipRecruiter's website makes this process so much faster by letting me manage candidates in one place. So today, uh, you can try ZipRecruiter for yourself for free. All you got to do is go to ZipRecruiter.com slash TNT. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash TNT. And we thank ZipRecruiter for their support of Tech News Today. In less than four hours, you can watch Google's DeepMind computer AlphaGo try to beat Lee Seidel, the top Go player of the past decade, in a $1 million five-game challenge match in Seoul. If he beats the champion, is that a success or a failure for the human race? Uh, and what mm. about machine learning is increasingly, what about the fact that machine learning is increasingly taking over our workplaces? Should we be relieved about that to get rid of the drudgery or terrified that we're about to lose our jobs? Joining us to talk about this is Noah Weisberg, CEO and co-founder of Kira Systems, a company that just inked a deal with Deloitte to help bring the power of machine learning to the workplace. Welcome, Noah. Hey, Megan, it is great to be back on. Well, thanks for coming on. So so what kind of drudge work is Kira best at eliminating? So we help uh, people review contracts faster and more accurately. So what that means is, uh, so prior to co-founding Kira, I was an M&A lawyer at a very large New York law firm. And I spent hours and then supervise people spending hours extracting data out of contracts. And what that means on a practical basis is, there are people who have to read through contracts, very uh, people who went to good law schools and uh, or good business schools that spend tons of time reading through contracts, trying to pick out details. So things like, when does this contract expire? Does it auto renew? Uh, can we assign it? What happens if a hurricane comes and wipes out all our factories? Um, what are prices under this contract? And there are people who spend tons of time doing that. Um, and, and they mess it up. So what our software, the drudgery that our software helps with is it does that work automatically. Um, it will find provisions and contracts and drop them into databases, into spreadsheets using our API. You can drop it automatically into a, another system that you have, like a contract management system. Uh, that, that is what our particular machine learning technology does. So would it be able to like go through all the daily tech news and figure out what's the most important <laughs> for people to... Uh <laughs> so someone um, wouldn't, let's say someone, anyone wouldn't have to spend their day on Twitter and reading all, all the news themselves? Uh, alas, um, <laughs> uh, alas, that is, that is not our specialty. We have had um, clients like Deloitte, for example, has used it on tweets to, to test out sentiment, um, like whether people are saying good or bad things about their clients. But uh, for the most part, people are trying to find the same things over and over again. So they'll be trying to find like these term provisions or assignment provisions can be very different contract to contract. But uh, what will happen is that lawyers will have to go through and find these specific provisions. And that's where our software kind of comes in handy. Like this is something that it could take people 45 minutes of contract to review a contract not using our software. And using our software, we hear, you know, in the 10 to 15 minute range often just finding these pieces of data. So, but you're still um, not going to get any help from us with uh, telling you who you should host on the show next. Okay. 
Uh, but if you're ever looking for machine learning talk <laughs> or a contract review, I'm happy to be of service there. So, so what kind of tasks are harder for machine learning? I mean, what what kind of tasks are like the, those kind of tasks? What are what's harder for a machine? So, actually, the really interesting thing is that a lot of the time, the things that are hard for a machine to learn are actually things that people are really good at, and vice versa. So. For us with teaching our system, it's actually pretty hard to get our system to accurately find like who signed an agreement or what the date of the agreement is or even what its title is. Whereas, and it would be super easy for, for you to figure that out, um, even though you haven't been to law school, uh, which I assure you would not be necessary for that. <laughs> On the other hand, um, even people who have been to really excellent law schools and practiced law for a while, have a lot of trouble finding things like what does this contract say about assignment or change of control or is this an exclusive agreement or is there an obligation not to compete under this agreement and those are things where a system like ours really excels and can do a great job and we continually hear and see our system catching things that people who review these contracts miss i I can't help like like I feel like more and more we're starting to hear about just like the just the crazy stuff that AI is 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 you know learning and and doing and obviously moving in directions that you know maybe we don't understand kind of the long term effects of AI uh, down the road. But let's say so AI comes in. <laughs> this is just a pure you know pure basic kind of viewpoint. I'm sorry, it, it doesn't have anything to do with you, no. what you guys have specifically, but I'm just like thinking of the long-term effects of AI as AI kind of comes in and, and takes the jobs that people are doing with computers because, you know, computer jobs seem by and large ripe for the picking uh, for AI to come in and, and do. do. Do we think that that signals kind of a move for people, for workers back into traditional labor? Um, and away from, you know what I mean? Like, because we've been moving towards be computers for so long. Uh, now are we moving away? Shoes by yourself or something like that. <laughs> like a, like a proper hipster. Um, <laughs> now, I think uh, what we're seeing is AI taking on a lot of work that's not that fun for humans to do. Like this contract review work. I, I went to uh, a, the NYU School of Law, which is like a good law school. And I got a job at Wagach Almanji's, which is like a terrific law firm. And you get into this job and you're a first year lawyer and all of a sudden you're doing this work that is really not that fun, right? And super high volume, right? Like you're doing this work at 2 a.m. and night after night, uh, just trying to extract data out of contracts. And technology like this, and we've heard this at Deloitte, um, it's taking work that junior auditors who have the same kind of background that I would have when I was practicing law, it's taking their work and allowing them to spend their time doing higher value work, right? So instead of just reading contracts and pulling out uh, revenue recognition sections, they're actually going through and really trying to look more aggressively at where there may be problems in what a company is presenting. Um, so I think AI, at least over the short term, I don't know that it's going to make us more like leather jacket designers, <laughs> but, uh, but maybe. Um, I, I do actually think, though, that, Jason, you're, you're pointing out something legit, which is that um, in combination with AI, uh, and I think you guys were talking about this a bit before, um, and as computers do more and more, there's going to be certain experiences where you really feel like having an authentic human experience sure. along with it. And uh, so I, I think you're right in that maybe it's not going to be more baristas, um, but that there will be a lot of opportunities where people are willing to pay extra for that real human touch. Sure. No, it's Becky Worley here, and I'm wondering if this is a fair parallel. You know, when we look at autonomous cars, uh, we say that the technology is pretty much there, but the legal system and people's acceptance of it are not there. Is that true here? I mean, I would imagine that there's a fair bit of liability and that potential clients are thinking, man, if we miss something really big because the AI didn't pick it up in the contract, that could be a million dollar mistake. Well, uh, actually, I think this is a great parallel to driving cars, Becky, but not necessarily the one um, that you were thinking of. The one where I'm thinking of the parallel to driving cars is that um, if we think about self-driving cars, like sure, maybe the Google car took a swerve around some sandbags and hit a bus, but like on the whole, that's its first accident in tons and tons and tons 
of driving, or maybe second, but very, very, very few accidents. And it's the same sort of thing with the machine learning contract review, where we consistently hear that people's overall accuracy is the same or greater using our software. And we'd never suggest that you rely on it fully. Like we're not saying give us the wheel and we'll just take you to the final destination, but rather we can help professional service firms like Deloitte or companies who are trying to get this information do it in a lot less time, like 20 to 90% less time and be more accurate along the way. So I think you, I could totally understand the liability point. And I think there are really, really, really interesting legal questions around like, what happens when a self-driving car runs down a person or what happens if you rely fully on AI software to review contracts and it makes a mistake. But, um, but right now, I think the relevant question is, are the people who are doing this work right now making mistakes? And there's no question there in driving and there's no question there in contract review. And can it be improved with the use of AI? And I think in both cases, it's a definite yes. Can AI get errors and omissions insurance? <laughs> so actually, a lot of what we do, that, that is a very good question. Uh, we've not tried yet. A lot of our clients <laughs> are places like Deloitte, right, where Deloitte is not passing this uh, work product onto their clients as is. Like rather, Deloitte is just giving you an audit and they're saying through the use of AI, we can give you, and they do demo this technology to their clients a bunch. And they will say, this is something that we can do that we think will give you a better audit. Uh, that will allow us to spend more time on thinking tasks and less time on things that you shouldn't be paying our rates for. Um, so because we're selling through Deloitte and it's really Deloitte who's doing the work, it's still the same thing that happened before our technology, just Deloitte is more efficient and more accurate thanks to using the technology. So do you have any yeah. tips for us and our audience about what uh, skills we can uh, keep up so as not to have our jobs stolen by robots? <laughs> <laughs> I think you guys are in great shape. I can't imagine anyone um, uh, taking over from what you do. Um, I would think about, so one of the things that prompted me to co-found Kira was thinking about my work and how much of it just seemed, and the work of people that I was supervising, and how much of it seemed like stuff that, people like me sort of getting uh, billing out at hourly rates like I was billing out at just shouldn't be doing at all and that software could really make an impact. If your job seems really boring and there are parts of your job that you really, really, really hate, uh, I would suggest that you need to move up the value chain and be doing things that don't seem like a computer could be doing them. But I think in a lot of cases, it's uh, like in this case, to me, it certainly seemed pretty obvious that this just wasn't something that people should be doing. Uh, and it was technologically hard to do, but it but it was done. Noah, thank you so much for joining us. Noah Weisberg is at Kira Systems, and uh, you can find him at kirasystems.com. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention that you've also written a board book about machine learning uh, called yes. Robbie the Robbie, Robot. Robbie the Robot <laughs> is here in the house. Oh. Uh, it is the world's first and only children's book on machine learning. Uh, that we've is gotten fantastic. very strong. Okay. Like we're at five stars on Amazon with like two reviews. It's a, it's a great book. I can attest. Thanks uh, so Thank much. you, Noah. Perfect. Thank you for having me on. All right. Take care. Take care. All right. Guys, on to the next story. We must report the news the, on the tech. The email is in from Dave who writes, I'm not going to do the whole thing like that. <laughs> on Monday's show, although I'm very good at it, on Monday's show, you briefly covered the rejection by the Supreme Court of Apple's appeal in the ebook price fixing case. There was a statement made in passing that Apple's actions in this case had somehow been beneficial for consumers. This is incorrect. The facts of the case are that Apple and the five biggest publishers had illegally colluded in efforts to raise the price of some ebooks, mostly new releases and bestsellers from $9.99 to $14.99, and that no one would be allowed to sell books cheaper than Apple. The net result is higher prices. Um, I don't, he, he's probably talking about, about me playing the devil's advocate that the publishers should at least have some sort of input as far as what their product is priced at. Uh, but like I said, devil's advocate, I was just making the conversation more interesting or so I thought, but you're right. That should not be possible. Right. Like, yeah. Collusion, collusion is not okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thanks for writing in. Coming up, Ian Thompson is here to talk about the NSA, Facebook, and Apple's fight with the FBI. But first, 
let's take a minute to thank the Ring Video Doorbell. They are the sponsor of this episode. Now, we've all gotten pretty used to being able to screen our calls on our phones. Somebody calls, don't answer it, easy. But what if you could do that with your doorbell? With the Ring Video Doorbell, you can. You can see and talk to anyone at your door, whether you're standing in your front hallway or if you're halfway across the world, you can screen your doorbell, my friends, using your smartphone. Ring's advanced motion detection alerts you, even if someone doesn't ring the doorbell, so you can see when family members or their friends or people working on your house are coming and going. With Ring Video Doorbell, you can talk to delivery people. If someone has to leave a package, you can keep an eye on it with your smartphone. Installing Ring takes minutes, and it works with either your current wiring or a built-in rechargeable battery. My battery went out, I charged it up, I put it back, easy peasy. Put your mind at ease and protect your home with the Video Doorbell, Time Magazine, and USA Today named one of their top 10 gadgets. Go to ring.com slash TNT for free expedited FedEx shipping. That's ring.com slash TNT. With Ring, you are always home. All right, so today was a bit security heavy. So to help us break it all apart into pieces is Ian Thompson from The Register. How's it going, Ian? Oh, pretty good. I'm recovering from RSA last week, which oh. was a ha hell of a conference, and I was a bit brain fried over the weekend. Yeah, I noticed you got a, you've got a bit of RSA still on your forehead. You might want to <laughs> that off. Okay, well. you're, you're good now. You're good now. It's gone. It's gone. I'm checking the mirror. Now. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do that on the air. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, so first things first. The Brooklyn, New York case that has the U.S. government trying to get access to data on an iPhone as part of a drug investigation. This was one of the first legal tests for the idea of opening up devices at the government's request. And last month, Judge Orenstein uh, sided with Apple, saying that the company did not have to provide extracted data. It's being seen as potentially a big influencer in the San Bernardino case. Uh, what's the new development with this case in New York, Ian? Well, basically, the FBI has asked the judge to look again at this and, and to actually give them permission to do it. What they're saying, in effect, is that this is, you know, this is beyond the judge in the, who made the original decision was treating this as a pivotal case in terms of privacy and security going forward. What, he, what the judge should have been doing is looking at this case on its individual merits alone and not considering the wider context of the, of the, of the action that was written. So they're saying to the judge, basically, look again, look specifically just at this particular drug dealer and uh, make your decision on that. Don't try and go for the bigger picture at all. Uh, which obviously would be very, very beneficial to them, but I can imagine Apple and various other people having a few other things to say about that. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think the likelihood is that this would get reversed? Do you think it's? Uh, I mean, I guess it's too. It's probably too early to know. But yeah, I mean, without without uh, doing a deep brain scan on the judge involved, there's, it's it's going to be very difficult. Um, I think on the whole, the FBI's uh, new filing doesn't really offer anything particularly new. I think it's it's kind of like a legal whack-a-mole thing. They, they got shot down once, so now they're trying to beat the next person over the head. And it's pretty clear that they're going to carry on doing this in case after case after case until they get what they want or until Congress rules on it. So, I mean, the FBI's position is, is really quite clear. They need access to this or they feel they need access to this, and that trumps everything else. Well, so the difference between the two cases, I mean, one that is a terrorism case, so that gets more headlines and gets more people thinking, uh, uh, also the FBI is still petitioning in the Brooklyn case, the FBI is still petitioning. And in the Apple case, they, you know, then ad, they've already gotten the warrant and then Apple is saying, you know, no, Apple's already refused. That's the difference between the two cases, correct? Well, yeah, I mean, the San Bernardino, San Bernardino case was, I mean, I've been talking to people about this last week, was very carefully picked by the FBI. You know, Apple had been working with the FBI on a number of other cases uh, under privacy, you know, but under on the on the, queue, on the quiet, as it were. Uh, then the FBI went public on this one. I mean, it's, a, as I say, a fairly well-picked out case, after all. Who could be against, you know, trying to track down terrorists? Uh, leaving aside the fact that, you know, he'd already destroyed his other phones and his other computers, which might have other stuff on, and just had his work phone on him. Um, in this case, in the New York case, however, it kind of goes against what the FBI has been saying in San Bernardino, because in San Bernardino, they're saying this is a one-off case, it, you know, it's just about this phone, and now all of a sudden the New York thing's coming up, and we've got word that prosecutors on the state and federal level are watching this very clear, carefully, and if the FBI gets its way, then Apple's going to be facing a flood of these sort of requests. Mm -hmm. So Apple is understandably going to fight this one very hard. It's not going to get resolved very quickly, and I think basically what the tech for the tech the tech industry is looking for is some kind of leadership from politicians and saying look 
we need to get a new law in place so that legislators can actually set down the rules on this rather than just relying on the courts to muddle through and build up case law on one side or the other. Uh, okay, well, we have two more cheery stories to uh, check in on. Uh, this one, wow, this, this, this is a doozy. The Guardian has an exclusive citing U.S. officials that say the FBI is revising its privacy rules for when it can access data on Americans that's been collected uh, by the NSA. What on earth is this all about, Ian? Well, the fact of the matter is it was approved by a secret court uh, whose rulings were secret and the revision changes are secret. Uh, but there's nothing to worry about because your government's in charge. It's it, it just <laughs> it, 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 it's Kafka. Kafka couldn't even make this up. I mean, it, it just makes it makes makes very little sense at all. Okay, here's what we think is happening. Um, the FBI is under fairly strict rules about what it can and cannot uh, cover in terms of communications by Americans. Now, what the NSA is collecting under Section 702 of the Patriot Act is it can scoop Americans' communications if they speak to somebody outside the U.S. Um, or two or three steps beyond that. So if somebody calls you from outside the U.S., then they'll be able to get that conversation, not just the metadata, but also the content of the conversation. Uh, and then the next two people you call, they also could have the content of their, of their conversation recorded. Now, what I suspect ha is happening is the FBI is looking for a loosening of these rules so that it can actually start collecting some data on American conversations. Um, and also there's been mentions of the... Um, the like, they have this very weird system as to whether or not a conversation is likely to be from an American. And from the NSA's rules, if there's a 51% chance that they're linked to the target, then they can just scoop all that data. So it's likely that the FBI is actually trying to say, well, hang on a second, we could use some of that as well. It would help us in a number of cases. So therefore, we're going to amend the rules, quite, uh, amend the rules slightly and not quite tell anyone what it is, but trust us because we're the government and we're all okay. This is one of the most obscure stories we could be covering, um, in part because so little information is actually available. One thing I found, um, I had no idea about this, is that the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board had recommendations that the uh, were, were implemented here, and that's why we should all feel calm and reassured. So I was like, who is the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board? Well, this is an independent agency uh, in the executive branch. It was uh, established after the 9-11 Commission uh, Act in 2007. And so they have five board members who actually kind of look, uh, an example, James Dempsey, uh, he was executive director at the Berkeley Center for Law and Technology. Um, and a lot of people like this who are acting as a check and balance within the system, and they all cannot say what their recommendations to preserve our civil liberties were because all of that is classified. But um, they are acting as an ombudsman for privacy and civil liberties issues within the government um, at that level where we can't really know what they're doing on our behest, but they're doing something. Indeed. I mean, but uh, my understanding is that they are very much an advisory board. So if the government listens to their advice and then says, yeah, I don't like that, then there's <laughs> well, really not what they can I do about that it. Too, but one of the things that I read about their last set of recommendations is 22 recommendations were made and 22 recommendations were implemented. Interesting. It's uh, now that's what, something that, that I hadn't heard about, but I have to say I'm a little bit surprised, given the that the Obama administration has been slightly dodgy in this area, to say the least. Um, I mean, there are a lot of pe a lot of good people on the board, and they're obviously thinking hard about these issues. But at the end of the day, you know, they are there to give advice. Now, m what worries me is that the FBI are doing this in secret. We have no way of knowing what the revisions are. We have no way of of knowing their justification for them. And, you know, we, we gave our law enforcement agencies this power in 2001 and they abused it quite terribly, as we found out when Stone started leaking. Now, being asked to take them on trust at this stage seems to me like a little bit of leap of faith based on past history. I can completely agree. And yet, what choice do we have? <laughs> <laughs> Good thing we live in the land of the free. Eh? <laughs> the land of the free and secret courts. Yes. Uh, well, in fact... James Clapper did a, a very a Q and A last uh, week before last, where he was saying, "No, no, it's not a secret court. Look, it's got a website and everything." And then <laughs> there's the a landing page, exactly. And then at the conference <laughs> yesterday, uh, in the conference last week, uh, one of the speakers says, "Well, okay, let's just um, 
it's the, it was the Microsoft uh, Microsoft president, uh, Brad Smith, who was just saying, I just want to play you when we tried to get in contact with the with the secret call. This is what happened. We have a phone number for them. We dialed it. It went, it went straight to answer phone with, if you have a message for the secret court, please leave it after the beep. <laughs> and that was it. You know, it's just like... John, so, please record the... Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, that would at least give you a slightly sick laugh about the whole thing. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. it's, it's just trying to deal with, with, with secret courts, making secret judgments, makes me, you know, yeah. more nervous than a long-tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs. <laughs> okay, got it. Uh, <laughs> We're always guaranteed to get at least one of yes. those for me, and I love it. Uh, finally, Facebook failed to rate limit pins on its beta site, something that was used in the password reset process. And one can imagine how that could possibly be abused. What exactly happened here, Ian? Oh, well, I mean, this was a very good security researcher who found what looks just to be a, a monstrously stupid flaw uh, in the beta site for Facebook. Now, as you say, as you say, there was a. If you're on the main Facebook site and you try and guess the the password of an account too many times, you get locked out. Now, that's a standard security measure for across the industry for stopping what we call brute force attacks. But in the beta version of that site, somebody had forgotten to add that section in, so you could just chuck passwords at it willy nilly. And given the poor state of most people's passwords, you'd probably be able to reset something fairly quickly. Hmm. Now. Um, Facebook did have actually fixed this, and they paid the guy 15000 under their bug bounty program, which is a big payout for Facebook, so it was obviously a serious issue. But the fact that, you know, their developers didn't actually think to slip this one in does did, did leave us a little bit shocked on this. It, it's a fairly rookie mistake. But, you know, to, to Facebook's credit, they, they there was an impressive timeline. Like, you know, he reported it, they fixed it the next day, they paid him the next day. You know, it was it was in some ways the way the system's supposed to work. Oh, yes, totally. I mean, it was complete vindication of the bug bounty system as it stands, but, you know, both in, in terms of Facebook, A, getting it so quickly and getting money to the developer, but also in the, in the fact that developers are now coming to these companies. I mean, you, I can remember 15 years ago, if you tried this with a company, chances are you get a legal letter accusing you of hacking and have to, have to hire your own lawyer to deal with it. With the advent of bug bounties like Facebook's and others, um, d developers are now able to make a pretty good living doing what they, you know, finding bugs, reporting to the companies, getting them fixed, and everybody wins. Because $15,000 is nothing to Facebook compared to the embarrassment of, and bad PR and loss of customer support if this had actually gone mainstream. The developer gets money, that's fine, the site is safer, everyone wins. And yet some companies are still holding out against bug bounties, which is really quite annoying. It is. And I mean... Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, when we're talking about the robots taking our job, like that that's a good career path to have. You know, there still has to be the person to make sure everybody has done everything correct, I guess. I thought you were thinking like uh, white hat hacking robots that just go I'm around. I'm sure those and, exist too. Yeah, that's but, true. Uh, we have code checker robots, basically, yeah. but... Mm -hmm. uh, mm. Yeah. But, there, but there's going to be mistakes, <laughs> and that, you know, I think that's a good job to have. Mm -hmm. a well, white this is hacker. it. I, I mean, I interviewed the um, the head of the Hacker One program, which is an independent bug bounty program, and I did ask him, you know, AI was a big theme of the conference. Are you ever concerned that an AI engine will put an AI engine will put you out of business? And he was like, well, quite frankly, no. Until the robots are writing the code themselves, and even then, you're going to have to want a human checking it at some point. But you know, as long as humans are in, involved in the software process, not only in writing the code, but also in integrating the code and putting various sections together and putting runtimes through, then there are always going to be mistakes. And bug bounties just make simple sense. They allow develop they allow researchers to make a living out of it. They make the company safer. And, you know, as I say, it's it's one of those things that is so blindingly obvious and yet some people are still fighting against it. It's just human nature, I guess. Yeah. It's hard it's hard to willingly open yourself up to that too, I think, when you're a company, you know, and be like, Yes, we invite you to find our insecurities, you know. Oh, uh, even the Pentagon's doing it now. Yeah. They've they've just announced this white hack hacker thing where they're gonna let hackers loose on some you know, non-sensitive systems, and that's an enormous step forward. Yeah, I mean, as I say, this is this is the kind of thing that got you in an orange jumpsuit very, very quickly if you tried that on Pentagon systems in the past. Sure, uh, Ian Thompson, always a pleasure getting you on the show. Tell people where they can follow all your awesome work online. Uh, you can always find me on the register and uh, on Twitter at, at at Ian Thompson. Mind the spelling, and don't worry, my parents and I have had words about that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ian. We'll talk to you Take soon. Care. Speak to you soon. Alrighty. TNT's fan of the day is Jay Parker on Instagram, who sent us this picture saying he's listening to the podcast while biking in Helsinki, Finland, in minus 11 degree weather. <laughs> Winter biking. Winter biking.
Wow, that's that is dedication. Impressive. Oh my! Nope. I mean, his 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 beard is frosted. Oh, that just looks mental distraction. Yes, yeah, uh, yeah. helps one to ignore physical pain. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there we go. Yes, good. Yes. We're good at helping you ignore physical pain. Show us how you watch or listen to TNT. Just record a video or take a picture of yourself or your setup. Post it on Instagram, Google+, Twitter, or Facebook. Use the hashtag HowIWatchTNT and we will find it. We will find it. Um, how do you feel about your photo roll? Do you want people to find that? Uh, or maybe you want to share it with the world willingly. More on that in a second, but before we do that, let's take a minute to thank FreshBooks. Uh, if you're a freelancer or you're a small business, you're feeling stressed out by stacks of receipts, spreadsheets, formatting nightmares, not enough time to deal with it all because, it, I mean, it all stacks up. It's hard to deal with that kind of stuff. We've got the solution that you've been looking for. It's going to simplify everything. It's FreshBooks. Our friends at FreshBooks have created awesome, easy-to-use cloud accounting software. Uh, it makes dealing with your taxes way less taxing. Uh, you can get started right away on FreshBooks. It couldn't be easier, even if you're not a numbers person. You know, they've got it all kind of worked out so that it's just easy to understand no matter where you're coming from. You can create and send invoices efficiently. You can get paid uh, quickly with FreshBooks payments. It's all kind of integrated in there. You also have the option to request a deposit in FreshBooks so that you can get paid up front. So there's, you know, no more of that covering the costs out of pocket or waiting until the end of a project to get paid. No more of that. Uh, and they made it incredibly easy for you to track your billable time. Now, FreshBooks recently announced their new EMV chip card enabled card reader. So you can check that out as well. Now you can easily accept credit cards wherever business happens to take you quickly, securely with their entirely redesigned iPhone app, plus create beautiful invoices in just seconds. It's almost like FreshBooks makes invoicing an art. With FreshBooks, you can focus on what you love most, and that's growing your business, the most important part. You'll wonder why you didn't start sooner with FreshBooks. All right, so getting started is simple. It's totally free for 30 days. Go to freshbooks.com slash TNT, and don't forget to enter tech news today in the how did you hear about us section. Start your 30-day free trial today, and we thank FreshBooks for supporting this episode of Tech News Today. Last week, we talked about apps that would share a random photo from your photo roll. But why not go ahead and share the whole thing? An app called Shorts does just that. Wired says Shorts came from the makers of an app called Highlight that was released in, at South by Southwest four years ago and has a similar purpose to help you find people in your area. Uh, okay, just discuss amongst yourselves sharing your photo roll. What do you think? <laughs> oh... You know, mm. this has accidentally happened to me. If you share an Apple ID with people in your family, you are sharing often your entire photo roll with That's them. That's true. Yep. Uh, my mother-in-law. <laughs> Not a good idea. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> There's nothing incriminating, but, you know, it's sort of like explaining things. And, <laughs> I mean, that's just with someone who I know, love, and trust right. uh, seeing all my photos. I cannot even imagine... Yeah, yeah, I think, I mean, it's it's interesting because it is this sort of new wave of like, I guess, curation not being cool anymore. You know, like the way Snap, Snapchat doesn't let you take a photo and then, you know, do a bunch of stuff to it and then put it on Snapchat. It just has to be a photo you take on Snapchat. It's supposed to be more authentic as we were talking before. So I think it's just kind of like that. Like, I'm an authentic person. See whatever's in my photo roll. I don't care. That's insanity. <laughs> I mean, also boring. Poor people who are looking at my phone. I mean, yeah. do you want that tile or that tile? The one that's a little creamy or the one that's a little silver? <laughs> so right? Thankfully, so, okay, obviously this is for those for people who just uh, apparently don't have the time or the patience for curation, for mm -hmm. choosing things on the go, and they just want to put it all up there. But there is a little bit of of choosing, right? Yeah. It's kind of part of the part of the process is that you are actually saying these go, these don't. So, you know, that picture that you take of that document, not meant for posting anywhere, but for remembering it when you're at the store, you know, that doesn't have to be shared and you can choose not to do that. But what could possibly go wrong? <clears throat> oh, oh, I know, right? You can hardly see how this could end up bad for you. Uh, beta testers actually shared, ended up sharing half of their camera rolls and they ended up taking two to three times more photos and videos when they knew that there was an audience for it. Mm -hmm. So there's, I suppose, something appealing about this, but I kind of already do this. Like you said, um, Becky, like, I do this to Google Photos. Like, 
you know, every single picture that I take, and I take a lot of pictures, and a lot of the same pictures, right? Like, I'm not just taking one picture when I'm taking a picture of somebody. I take, like, three or four so that I make sure that I get one that doesn't have a little bit of a smear, you know, or blur or whatever. Um, I mean, it's it's all being shared to Google Photos. So is the, is, is the fear that we don't want to overshare to a giant behemoth company like Google or Facebook? Or is it that we just don't want the access the access to also be given to the public to see it? I think it, because I think they're kind of both in a certain sense. Is it anonymous on the app? No, I mean you no. go you sign in and no, it's not an anonymous app. And it's huh. just it's like Tinder except for, you know, so you look around <laughs> at all the people, but it's not just like the curated <laughs> Yeah, sort of. <laughs> Not just the curated, you know, profile that you put, but like this is me. This is the these are the pictures I take. Right. Okay, do you guys have your phones on you right now? No, I don't. Oh, see, I want to see the last photo you took. I well, see I can see that through I my don't iCloud know. I'm gonna, or my Google I'm not, Photos. I'm see, not. doesn't it make you feel a little nervous? Like, imagine if you had to just like bust let's that out and show let's it. See. Okay, let, yeah, because oh, they all I, go up to Google Photos. So I, I suppose see. I could do this. I suppose, but it I, might surprise and delight you. Uh, oh, it's a pinwheel. It, well, yeah, this morning before school, my five-year-old took or my six-year-old took a pinwheel from inside and ran out in the middle oh. of the yard and and planted it, <laughs> and okay, then got yeah. in the car and we went to school. And I was like, "That is awesome!" So I took a picture. See, of that it. sort of so, surprises and delights me. Yeah, yeah. I kind of like that. I know, I do yeah. too. <laughs> Mine, I don't know if you can see. This is it. Um, it's that's what it is. Is it <laughs> a light? The light. <laughs> it what is. Is. Um, it, I was trying to take a picture of something my child drew, and ah. I kind of moved the camera. Um, so, yeah, uh, that, that was what that is, yeah. <laughs> so that does not surprise and delight me. No, no it's exactly. I'm neither surprised okay, well, yeah, here's or delighted. Here's the other one. Here's the actual picture of what they drew. You can't see that either. Yeah. There we see, go. See, that's the good picture, there right? There we go. Oh, hey, okay. that's, that's good artwork <laughs> right, right there. So, but yeah, I my child's artwork. The, the mistakes to get there, right? Yeah, I mean, and I'm probably I not picking up anyone on Tinder with that or the Tinder <laughs> photos with that picture. Probably of my not. Which is good. That's what I don't want that. I just don't know. I mean, I don't know. Like, I, sometimes I have a hard time filtering through my camera roll because there's just so many pictures. I don't know how, you know, and, and like, for example, you go over to someone's house. Like, this was always the thing. You go over to someone's house. They just got back from their vacation. Hey, why don't I show you all the pictures from my vacation here? You pull up a stair next to me and I'll show you all the pictures. Yeah. And about halfway through, you're like bored out of your mind because they aren't your pictures. Right. Yeah, granted, those are beautiful views, but you weren't there, so you have no connection with mm -hmm. it. Do people really want to see all of that stuff from your camera roll? No. <laughs> There we go. No, so this is not <laughs> going to be the darling of South by Southwest then. I don't know. What every day, except for Twitter, that's a that's a death knoll. I mean, yeah. Meerkat yeah, that's true. going down. Even, even Foursquare. Uh, last year, I think it was also um, Fire Chat. Do you remember Fire uh -huh. Chat? Yeah. It mm -hmm. created a peer-to-peer -peer mesh network between phones without a cell network. And it's a cool concept, and they actually can probably implement that in many ways, but... Yeah, I don't see that everywhere. I think what it is, as far as South by Southwest is concerned, is it happened with Twitter. It kind of, it, yeah, it happened with Foursquare, which was like the follow-up year. And then everybody just decided to, to you know, write history going forward and say, it always happens at South by Southwest. And so now every year we're looking for the thing that it's going to happen to at South by Southwest. And it just doesn't work like that. Not anymore. It's one of the hardest <laughs> conferences to cover because you just are not sure there's actually going to be any there there. Yeah, yeah, good point. Okay, so <laughs> what's what's there, your there? last photo on your uh, that you took? Yeah. Uh, oh, Becky. I shared. I posted. There's a screenshot. I hope you can see this. It was a screenshot that oh. I took of my computer. Ah, uh, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. I was trying to order some tile, and the standard shipping was free, but the uh, expedited shipping for these 70 tiles was three million two hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> so yeah. Well, you That's posted that on Facebook like four days ago. You need to take more photos, Becky. I know. Clearly. Yeah, you, you wouldn't be sharing many photos in this regard, so you have little to worry about. You just don't take many pictures to begin with. No, but with, there's so. like 700 up my kid's nose, so <laughs> okay. that would make quite a collection. There you go. Awesome. Right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. As always, it is a pleasure, and uh, I think we'll see you in two weeks, correct? Yeah, you'll see me around. I'll we'll be see, around. Yes. Uh, I am yeah. at B Worley on Twitter, and I have a request for all of our viewers here, which is I am curious if you... If you could have a, a podcast that was custom made just for you, what would be the three subjects in it? Ooh. Tweet that to me at B Worley. Three subjects in a podcast. Got it. Just for you. It can be completely arcane, specific, individualized. 
I just am very curious. At B Worley on Twitter, B W O R L E Y. I'm curious too. I'm going to do that too. I have some ideas. <laughs> oh, I want to hear. <laughs> Thank you, Becky. We'll Thanks, talk guys. To you soon. All right, TNT records live every Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, 12 a.m. UTC at twit.tv slash live. You can be a part of the show by emailing us at tnt at twit.tv. You can leave us a short voicemail, 260-TNT-SHOW, and you can find us on Twitter. We are at Tech News Today TV. Thank you for listening all the way to the end of Thank the you. show. If you haven't already subscribed, you can find all the ways to subscribe at twit.tv slash TNT. Also, we are on Facebook. We are at facebook.com slash TV. So go there and you can see segments of our show and stories that we like, some story that we, stories that we reported, some that we decided not to report. But there is some tech news there for you. And if you want to tweet at me, I am at Megan Maroney. And I am at Jason Howell. Thanks to our technical director, Kara Cole, and all the folks who help us produce this show every single day. And thanks to you for talking tech today. Uh, we'll see you all tomorrow. Bye. Let's see if I can take a picture. Did it work? <laughs> Did it work? Hey, it worked. Awesome. I even got a little, little thing out <laughs> it of it. It looks like I'm slapping you.